Hello, everyone. My name is Chris from National Parents Organization, and today I'm here with Dr. Burnett, and he has got some exciting things for us today. He's on, on a study group, and they're trying to get uh, parental alienation put into the DSM-5, which is a book that psychiatrists and practitioners use, and I think that would have some profound effects across uh, the industry and would help families out. Dr. Burnett, thanks so much for coming on today. Sure, Chris. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, why is why is it important to get this terminology put into the DSM-5? And maybe just introduce us uh, formally. Uh, there's a specific section that you're trying to do this in, right? What section is that? So this is a big project. The uh, actual terminology that we're trying to get into the DSM is called Parental Alienation Relational Problem, or EARP. And... Um, there's a particular part of the DSM that has relational problems. Other people might be familiar with uh, a term called the parent-child relational problem or the other new diagnosis called child affected by parental relationship distress. Those are in this section. And it's a, it's a particular chapter of the DSM called other conditions that might be of clinical interest. And it's kind of important. There's a little nuance here that's good to understand, which are most of the diagnoses in the DSM are called disorders. For instance, schizophrenia is a disorder. Uh, bipolar is a disorder. But this chapter, they're called relational problems or conditions. They're, they're, called, they're not called mental disorders. They're called mental conditions. And th that's an important distinction. The main distinction is that mental conditions occur or at least relational problems occur between one person and another person. In other words, schizophrenia, the condition, the disorder is in the mind of, of the individual and relational problems are between one person like a child and a parent. So it's real important for us is that it's easier. There are all sorts of rules about getting something new in the DSM and it's easier to get a relational problem in the DSM than it is the disorder. So I think we're on, on a pretty good track to get parental alienation relational problem in the DSM. So, I mean, currently, if, you know, if, if you go to a professional and you have, uh, you know, your, your ex-spouse or somebody is, you know, alienating you from the children, um, what does that professional do? They really, uh, do they have any framework within the DSM-5 currently to say, you know, hey, this is a problem uh, I know in some instances we've seen uh, parental alienation classified as abuse. Uh, you know, what, what are the professionals doing right now? And, and how would this, you know, if we were to get this relational problem in the DSM, uh, how would that change uh, what these professionals could do to help families out? Right now we have criteria uh, for how to diagnose parental alienation. So that's, that's been published and that's getting pretty well known. It's called the five factor model for the diagnosis of parental alienation. And then even now, if, if a, a clinician evaluates a family or a child and they make that diagnosis, even now there are, there are terms in the DSM that can be used. I mentioned one a minute ago called uh, child affected by parental relationship distress. That's an official, it's a complicated term, but it's an official DSM diagnosis that can be used in a case of parental alienation. And also, there's another term called child, or it's called parent-child relational problem. That's when there's conflict between a parent and a child. And thirdly, there's another diagnosis called uh, uh, child psychological abuse that could be used. And like if you're a, a custody evaluator and you're writing up a report, those are three different terms that can be used now. But the problem is none of them are really specific for parental alienation. And what we need is to have a term that really specifically describes parental alienation that gives the criteria for the diagnosis. And this is, this is really important for a number of reasons, but th that this is basically what we're trying to accomplish in the next few months. Specifically, this would allow clinicians to diagnose parental alienation, is that correct? That's right. If they're doing a report, they, they could diagnose PARP, parental alienation relational problem, or if they're testifying in court, they can say that they've evaluated this family and that it's a condition that is uh, defined in the DSM-5. Yeah, I think that's a huge step. And you've done a significant amount of work in this area in helping to try and quantify 
uh, parental alienation, right? You have you came up with a, a model that allows people to sort of empirically figure uh, figure this out. Amy Baker and I developed this uh, diagnostic uh, procedure called the the five factor model, and so there are five things you need to have in order to have this diagnosis. I, I'll run through them real quick. You have to have contact refusal. In other words, the child has to be refusing to see the other parent. You have to have a previous good relationship with that parent. There has to be an absence of abuse that would, that would explain the child's contact refusal. Fourthly, there's the presence of alienating behaviors. Those are the things that the uh, favored parent does to induce alienation of unknown behavioral signs of alienation in the child. So that was a big step. And that got published in a really important journal only a few months ago. So actually that was, we were kind of waiting for that to happen before we launched this current campaign to get uh, PARC into the DSM. So once uh, PAR gets into the DSM, what's what's the next step? Is it really an education campaign for both clinicians and for uh, you know for the le- the legal teams, you know, for the lawyers and the judges? Um, what's what's sort of the next steps after this? Well, uh, the, the first thing that will happen is I think well there'll be a lot of articles. I mean, if this happens, there are going to be a lot of articles written about parental alienation uh, to educate uh, social workers and psychologists and psychiatrists and. And, and attorneys and judges. There'll be a flurry of interest in publishing articles. But that will hopefully lead to educating uh, mental health and legal professionals while they're in their training, for instance, in graduate school. If it's in the book, they're more likely to be educated. And perhaps most important is once they're in practice, they'll be more likely to identify it soon in other words, mild, moderate, and severe. It, when it's mild, they'll be more likely to realize it's there and to do something about it. And that's our hope, is that when that happens, there'll be fewer cases that progress to uh, more severe levels of parental alienation. You know, as far as science goes, the parental alienation is, is kind of a relatively new thing, uh, isn't it? I mean, we've, we've talked about it. Uh, I've seen it, you know, references in the literature going back um, but really, it's only been seriously studied, I think, recently. And uh, now getting into the DSM-5, I think, gives it a lot of legitimacy uh, that, you know, where in the scientific community, there was, there's been a lot of argument about whether this is a real thing or not. And I think we can definitely say it, it's a real thing now. Is that, um, you know, your impression of it? Or, or where do you think the scientific community is going with this? Oh, I think we're really moving. Um, the parental alienation... Uh, kind of the phenomenon had been mentioned sporadically in legal cases and in uh, psychology writings for many, many years, maybe a hundred years. But uh, it, it was only named parental alienation in 1985, and it has only been studied really systematically in the last 15 or 20 years. In the last 15 years or so, there have been many different really important research studies published, you know, some of which have to do with, how, is there a systematic way to distinguish uh, alienated children from non-alienated children, as an example. Mm-hmm. But there's research on other things, like what is the prevalence, how often does parental alienation happen in the community, uh, what work for different types of alienation. So the, the, the research has really taken off, which I think means that we're ready for this step to get it into the and what do you think um you know what do you think is next is there is there more research you think that that needs to be done as focus on specific areas or um you know what, what do you think is next for parental alienation as far as the scientific community goes well uh in the future oh there's lots of stuff we need to do uh, one has to do with interventions we really need to have a little bit more work on what's the best intervention for mild moderate and severe cases since, it, since it, they're quite different. And is there is there an, a more efficient way to do it? Like right now there aren't interventions, but some of them are very expensive. And so we need to figure out if there's a more cost efficient way to provide these services. Um, I think we need to do research uh, on the diagnostic methods. In other words, we need to be have, have really uh, 
a clear-cut method for identifying these children or these families. I mean, there are methods now. I think the, the stuff, the material we publish is very good, but I think it could be uh, improved in some specific areas. So th I think those are the main things. Well, I, I, I failed to mention prevention. Uh, in the future, we hope to devise maybe different ways to even address divorce and, and child custody. You know, do we really need to go to court over all these things? Is there, is there some more humane way to address separated and divorced? So that's something that attorneys need to, need to get involved with, judges and, and other people who are really interested in prevention. Yeah, certainly. I think uh, preventing is is probably the the best uh, case scenario because certainly on the extreme ends, you know, the very severe cases, it's very detrimental uh, to the kids. At least what we've seen, and uh, you know, nobody wants anything to go quite that far. And and certainly, uh, you know, from the National Parents Organization pers prospect, we we certainly don't want courts enabling uh, parental alienation, which we've seen in the past. Um, so hopefully this guidance out there will, will help uh, both ends of those spectrums. Is there any other topics you want to talk about or anything that we missed? This uh, exhibit that we had uh, uh, last week in Toronto, this campaign to get parental alienation into the DSM has taken a number of different forms. We, we've, we've done it in a several different ways. But one thing we did at, the, at this big, big meeting of child psychiatrists uh, last week in Toronto, we had an exhibit, like a booth in the exhibit hall. And I want oh, to cool. show you, I want to show your, your listeners the, uh, what we had on display there. Can you pull that? Are you able to pull that up? This uh, sort of uh, was seen by hundreds of child psychiatrists and many of them logged in and endorsed our proposal. So th the main thing that uh, y'all can see on this poster is our website that if you want more information and if you want to endorse the proposal, go to this website. It's really easy. It has the word PARP in it. It's www.parp-dsm.info. In other words, PARP-dsm. So people can go there and can actually read the proposal. And there are several appendices. We have a list of uh, more than 2,000 people have endorsed this and you can actually pull up the list and see who has signed on to this. And there's also a link in the website for how to endorse it yourself. So we really hope that um, some of your members and your listeners will go to the website and endorse uh, our proposal. And we really appreciate it if you all do that. Yeah, I, I hopefully everybody that's listening to this will go out and, and hit the website. It's parp-dsm.info. Um, so hit the website up and you can read the, uh, the proposal and also uh, sign the petition. And how many people have signed the petition so far? Oh, we have more than 2,000. Uh, but they're identified. Some of them are individuals. Some of them are organizations. And so the organizations are advocacy groups. Some of them are actual professional organizations. So there's a lot of different, but there's a category for um, parent or for family child advocates, which are mostly parents, alienated parents and alienated grandparents. So people in that, if, if that's what uh, y'all, your listeners might be, then uh, they, should, they can sign in and endorse it and they can identify themselves as a family or child advocate. And that's how they would be listed on this uh, this big big list of endorsed of endorsers. So, has there been any resistance to uh, putting this in the DSM five? Are there any are any organizations or groups that are against this uh, addition? Well, they haven't come out yet. We started this in July, and we're going to wrap it up in November. Like this is not going to go on forever. And actually, this is almost November right now. And and. and late November, about three weeks, we're going to wrap it up, now finalize the proposal, finalize the list of endorsers, and, and send it in to this particular committee at the DSM that handles this. And uh, I've gotten a few people uh, have told me they don't think it's a good idea. And a few people have posted online that they don't think it's a good idea. But um, it's so far, it's been pretty minimal. Um, I am concerned that once it really gets submitted, see what will happen once it's submitted, there will be a uh, 
time for public comment. The, the DSM itself will announce that there's a new proposal being considered and they, they, wel they welcome public comment. So at that point, um, there may be a lot, there may be opposition might come forward directly to the DSM. Yeah, so it that's why like we need lots of people backing this up. Um, so, yeah, so we really appreciate your. Well, yeah, absolutely. We'll get this out there. And then when it finally gets through committee and gets uh, published for public comment, we'll also uh, publish, you know, this again so that people can go in and comment, you know, directly on the DSM-5 that they support it. Um, well, so what's the timeline, do you think, between uh, when you submit to when they'll come out with public comment? Is it is it a known time or is it unknown? That step, I think, might take uh, maybe a couple of months. In other words, it, they have their own internal committees and they have to look at the proposal and and they have to decide whether or not it merits further consideration. And I think it might take them a couple of months to do that. But even after that, there are other steps involved with the American Psychiatric Association. And so the, the whole thing might take many months, actually a year maybe, to come to a, um, a conclusion one way or the other. And do you know, I, I know there used to be a DSM-4 and then they went to a DSM-5. Would this be included in the DSM-6 or would it be included in a revision of the DSM-5? How does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, nowadays, the revisions uh, happen on an ongoing basis. In other words, you, you don't, they don't wait 10 years for DSM-6 to come out. What happens is uh, they consider new proposals, that committees consider them uh, they go for approval at a higher level. And if they're approved, they're, they, are, they go ahead and get posted in the, uh, on the online version mm. of the DSM, which is now called DSM-5TR, which stands for text revision. And so they, it, you don't have to wait for, the, for it to be published hard copy, that once it's on the online version, that's the official definitive version of the DSM. So, um, so we don't have to wait years. We, we, but we do have to wait a few months for them to make it. Well, things certainly move a lot quicker than they used to. It's one of the great things about technology. Um, any, any final thoughts before we go today? No, I think we're good. I really appreciate your hospitality, Chris. Well, we, we certainly appreciate all the work that you're doing for families everywhere, you know, and, and the, the research that you've done and coming up with the ways to quantify, you know, this sort of thing. Um, you know, it helps a lot of families out and, and we are certainly appreciative of that. We wish you uh, the best on this. We're all kind of in the same boat. I, I really hope that this goes through and anything we can do to support it, just let us know and uh, definitely keep us posted on, uh, on what's going on. And we, we'd be glad to get the, uh, the word out there as things come up. Okay, that's great.